Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Radcliffe Chambers Junior Programme webinar. I'm Matt Mills, and joining me in the commentary box is Natalie Pratt. Good morning, Natalie. Hi. This morning, we'll be talking to you about charity law. And first up to bat is Natalie. She'll be covering trustees' duty and power to invest, and in particular, the recent decision in Butler Sloss. I'm then up next, and I'll be talking to you about professional charity fundraisers. We'll finish by taking any questions you might have. If you do have any questions for us, please just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question in there, and only we'll see it. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Natalie. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Matt says, I'm talking to you this morning for about 20 minutes on trustees' powers of investment. Um, and this is quite a topical uh, issue at the moment, because very recently, on the 29th of April of this year, uh, the High Court, uh, and specifically Mr Justice Michael Green, handed down uh, judgment in Butler Sloss and Charity Commission and HM Attorney General. Uh, now, broadly, uh, this case concerns the question of whether trustees can adopt an investment policy that will deliver less advantageous financial returns, at least in the short term, uh, on the basis that the policy would be excluding investments that conflicted with the charity's objects. Now, the trustees wanted to know if they could do that, or if in doing that and adopting that policy, uh, they would be in breach of duty. Um, and that's a very important question for a trustee. Nobody wants to be in breach of duty, especially when you consider uh, that personal liability would flow from a breach of duty. It's a very important question. Uh, so in overview, what am I doing today? As I've said, looking at the Butler Sloss decision, um, hopefully answering for you three questions, or at least discussing three topics, even if I don't answer questions. Uh, what is the case about? What did the court decide? And how does this case impact on trustees and trustee decision making? Um, now, if you are an avid follower of the Radcliffe Chambers Junior Programme, in particular mine and Matt's charity sessions, uh, you may remember that in June of last year, uh, I did a uh, legal update webinar and I flagged the Butler Sloss decision then uh, because on the 14th of April last year, we just had the uh, decision from Mr Justice Michael Green granting these two charities in this particular case uh, permission to bring the proceedings. So he, that, that permission was needed under section uh, 115 sub 5 of the 2011 Act. Um, so it's been a really quick turnaround. We've gone from the 14th of April last year uh, to a final hearing at the front end of March of this year uh, and judgment on the 29th of April. Um, so really speedy turnaround from all involved. Uh, and pretty impressive by all accounts. So the background to this decision. Um, so case concerns two charities, the Ashton Trust and the Mark Leonard Trust. And the trustees of these two charities were seeking declarations that it was lawful for them to adopt their proposed investment policy. Um, so they're essentially seeking the court's blessing for what they're trying to do. Uh, now, the Ashton Trust uh, had general charitable purposes, and then the trustees had decided to principally pursue three uh, statutory purposes, those being uh, environmental protection or improvement, prevention or relief of poverty, and relief of those in need by reason of youth, age, ill health, disability, financial hardship, or other disadvantage. Um, the Mark Leonard Trust was incredibly similar, um, also had general charitable purposes, and then uh, the trustees had elected to focus on particular statutory purposes. Uh, they were slightly more limited for the Mark Leonard Trust, so the purposes were environmental protection or improvement uh, and relief of those in need. Now, both of these charities are grant making charities, and they are charities, uh, sorry, they are trusts in the true sense, so they are unincorporated. Um, now, both of these charities have fairly significant assets as well. So the Ashton Trust has assets of somewhere in the region of £42 million, and the Mark Leonard Trust has assets in the region of £22 million. Now, the trustees of each of these charities wanted to adopt an investment policy that excluded investment, insofar as it was possible to do so, or practically possible to do so, um, exclude those investments that are not aligned with the Paris Agreement. Um, now, you may remember the Paris Agreement is a UN agreement that was signed in uh, April 2016. It was signed by 195 countries. Um, so remember, it's 
at country level, it's more about private individuals and corporations and charities and whatnot. Um, so it was signed by 195 countries, ratified now by 189 of those countries. Uh, and that agreement has the principal aim of reducing global warming to below two, uh, two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and then pursuing further uh, efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees. Um, now, in light of these charities' charitable purposes, the trustees decided that they wanted their total greenhouse gas emissions from their investment portfolios to be limited to comply with that 1.5 degrees Celsius target. And the trustees took the view that investments that were not aligned with the Paris Agreement would be in direct conflict with the charity's charitable purposes. So you might think that actually really the answer to this question ought to be really obvious. And of course, a charity uh, is able to adopt an investment policy that excludes investments that are in conflict with its charitable purposes. Um, and why really do we need to go to the court uh, to get the court's blessing to do this? Um, however, as is often the way, sadly, the answer is not that straightforward. Um, and principally, that's for three reasons. Um, the first is that the leading authority in this area, and really the only authority, uh, is about 30 years old. Um, and that's the case here on the slide, so Harry's and Church Commissioners for England, which is also known as the Bishop of Oxford case. Um, it's not just the fact that that decision uh, is a little bit old. I say old and look at my own age and think, gosh, is 30 really old? Um, but it's not just the fact that the decision is a little bit old that causes a problem, it was also the reach of the decision in the Bishop of Oxford case that was a little bit unclear. Um, so when we go through the slides in a minute, we'll see that some of the language used by the Vice, Vice Chancellor in that case was a bit unclear. Um, so he was using the word should, and it wasn't clear whether that imposed a mandatory obligation on trustees or not. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is the Bishop of Oxford case was decided in very different circumstances, and the discussion that took place in the case, therefore, was again in the context of very different circumstances and in a very different uh, legal and factual landscape. Uh, the second reason why the trustees felt they probably ought to go to court to get the court's blessing is that the proposed investment policies did actually exclude or would exclude over half of publicly traded companies and also many commercially available investment funds. Um, so that was quite a significant limit on the investable universe for the charity. And again, that's in contrast to the examples that were being considered in the Bishop of Oxford case. Uh, and it's perhaps another reason why these principles uh, governing this area of law and the Bishop of Oxford case needed uh, revisiting. Uh, and the third reason is that it was almost certain uh, that there would be some uh, financial detriment to the charity, uh, at least in the short term. That was largely owing to the fact that that investable universe was going to decrease so dramatically. Um, now it was expected that over time the investable universe would increase again um, as more companies and more investments and more sectors get up to speed uh, climate change goals. Um, but the discussion in the Bishop of Oxford case was really centering around examples uh, where there were plenty of other investment options left open to trustees and that financial detriment uh, would be quite limited if, if indeed there would be any at all. Um, so again, another reason why the trustees felt that perhaps they ought to go to the court for the court's blessing and perhaps also why the Bishop of Oxford case itself uh, and the principles therein might need revisiting. Um, actually, before I move away from this slide, financial detriment, I ought to say, but the two proposed investment policies um, did actually have a target rate return of CPI plus 4%. Now, CPI plus 4%, the Charity Commission conceived as uh, the hearing, was in line, broadly in line, with lots of other large charities uh, that had assets of a commensurate size of these charities. Um, but yes, herein lies the problem. And the question that vets is the trustees, can they adopt a policy that will cause financial detriment simply on the basis that the policy is in line with the charity's objects, and also in circumstances where a more advantageous policy could be adopted, but that policy or that more advantageous policy would conflict with the charity's objects. So before you read the decision, and before we go on to consider the, the next couple of slides, I think there are two important points to keep in the front of our minds. Um, the first is that a power, uh, the trustees' powers of investment 
are conferred by the trustee or the governing instrument, whatever that may be. Uh, and also where you've got an unincorporated charity, uh, the Trustee Act 2000, the Member Trustee Act 2000 also includes um, some duties. Now, the important point to remember here is that if your trustee or your governing instrument prohibits or excludes specific types of investments, then there is no question. You simply can't make that investment. So if you are starting fresh, or if you are overhauling your governing documents, um, in thinking about including prohibitions and exclusions in the governing document might be a way of circumventing some difficult questions uh, for trustees uh, later down the line. Um, the second important point to bear in mind or keep in front of your mind when you're reading uh, Butler's Loss uh, is the primacy of the charitable objects of the charity. Um, so you probably all remember the SIF case from the Supreme Court and in particular the uh, judgment of, La of Lady Arden. Um, fiduciary duties of charity trustees are owed to the charitable object. That's what we learned from SIF. Uh, and so therefore the overriding duty of a charity trustee is to further the purposes of the charity. So the first port of call for Mr. Justice Michael Green in Butler's Loss is the Bishop of Oxford case. Now, the Bishop of Oxford case in, in there, the Vice Chancellor said that the starting point for charity trustees is that they should be maximizing financial return. And in most cases, that will be what is in the best interest of the charity, because quite frankly, charities always need money. He then goes on to set out what he said are three comparatively rare exceptions to that starting point. Uh, and I put them here on the slide. So the first is direct conflict. So where is a direct conflict between an investment and the charity's objects? And the example, the really easy example that's given here all the time is a cancer charity investing in a tobacco company. The uh, second comparatively rare exception are indirect conflicts. And this is where an investment may alienate supporters or donors to the charity or make recipients of the charity uh, less willing to be helped. Uh, so what we've got here are sort of relational and reputational factors coming into play. We then have this third rather awkward category. Uh, so where trustees are justified in departing from what would otherwise be their starting point. Um, now, helpfully, and again, as is often the way, there is absolutely no explanation in the case as to what that means. Um, but it is made very clear that decisions cannot be made simply by taking into account moral considerations, especially where that uh, will cause a financial detriment to the charity. Uh, and the reason for that is that different people will have different legitimate views on morality, and it really is uh, too ambiguous and too amorphous a concept uh, on which to base decisions, and especially investment, important decisions like investment decisions. So, uh, but Schloss falls into the first category. It is a case where we have a direct conflict engaged. We have, on the one hand, investments not aligned with the Paris Agreement, direct, and directly conflicting with, on the other hand, uh, a charity with the purpose of environmental protection. And an important issue that arose out of the Bishop of Oxford case, and which Mr. Justice Michael Green had to consider in Butler Schloss, is whether the Bishop of Oxford case imposed an absolute prohibition on investments that directly conflict. So is there an absolute prohibition? Or is it a case that the trustees still have a discretion as to whether they invest? And actually the conflict is just a major factor to be considered when exercising that discretion. Um, now this argument arises because of the language used uh, in the judgment and in particular the use of the word should. Um, so big wall of text on the slide. Uh, I will read out the important bit. Uh, so if, as would be likely in those examples, um, so he's just given examples of direct conflicts, so the cancer charity and the tobacco company. Um, so if, as would be likely in those examples, trustees were satisfied that investing in a company engaged in a particular type of business would conflict the very objects that charity is seeking to achieve, they should not invest. Carry to its logical conclusion, the trustees should take this course, even if it would be likely to result in significant financial detriment to the charity. So pausing there, this is the bit that causes us the difficulty, it's the use of the word should 
is this imposing a mandatory obligation that as soon as you have a direct conflict, that investment cannot be made. Um, the rest of the paragraph is actually quite important because it gives us uh, an indication as to the factors that are being considered and actually the context in which this decision is being made or these comments are being made. Um, so the logical conclusion, while sound as a matter of legal analysis, is unlikely to arise in practice. The next bit is particularly important. It's not easy to think of an instance where in practice, the exclusion for this reason of one or more companies or sectors from the whole range of investments open to the trustees would be likely to leave them without adequately wide range of investments from which to choose a properly diversified portfolio. So here we have the vice chancellor thinking, well, look, even if you have to exclude some investments on the basis of direct conflict, the investable universe will probably remain so large that the difference is really negligible. Um, so importantly, if you read this paragraph as an absolute prohibition on directly conflicting investments, then all of these types of investments are automatically excluded. Um, now, in 1992, when the Bishop of Oxford case was decided, uh, and in the relatively straightforward example of a cancer charity not investing in tobacco companies, where the investable universe remains pretty large, you can imagine that an absolute prohibition on those types of investments is perfectly workable and will probably have very little, if any, financial detriment. Vice Chancellor, however, was not thinking about 2022 and the examples of charities with the object of um, environmental protection trying to invest only in companies that are aligned with the Paris Agreement and where that policy would exclude almost half of the investable universe. You can, you can see in the second scenario that Barbara Schloss was facing, um, the landscape of the question becomes markedly different. So, what does Mr. Justice Michael Green decide? Well, he says that direct conflicts should be treated in the same way as indirect conflicts, and there is no absolute prohibition. Two key quotes here on the slide, paragraph 71, he says, seems to me that the Vice Chancellor is not, as a matter of law, distinguishing between a category one case of a direct conflict and a category two case of indirect conflicts. Paragraph 72, he says, I do not think that the Vice Chancellor intended to be so categoric, and his use of the word should means something less than must. It does not preclude the consideration of other important factors. It is just that a direct conflict is likely to be the most significant factor and should be avoided if possible. So therefore, even if you are in a case or in a situation where you have a direct conflict, it's still a matter of trustee discretion as to whether you invest or not. Um, but the trustees do have to perform a balancing exercise. Uh, and a direct conflict in that balancing exercise is likely to be a very significant factor. It's given very great weight. And ideally, you should be avoiding direct conflicts wherever possible. Um, now, in the event, in the Butler Schloss case, uh, Mr. Justice Michael Green gave the court's blessing to the proposed investment policies he felt in the circumstances of the case, uh, the balance had been adequately struck. But that leads us to the question of what is the law now? And how should trustees approach decision making, uh, especially if they are taking into account non-financial considerations when they are exercising their power of investment? Um, now, the Butler Schloss case and the decision that was to come from it was understood by everybody as being the opportunity to give much needed clarity to this area of the law. It wasn't simply um, a situation where the court would just be considering the declarations in the charity, in the cases in front of it, and making an appropriate ruling. This was a chance to clarify this area of law, uh, especially given that the Bishop of Oxford case was 30 years old and we had all these other uh, prevailing ambiguities. Um, and so with that in mind, Mr. Justice Michael Green at paragraph 78 uh, sets out 10 principles. Uh, I won't read them all in full because I'm conscious of the time and that Matt needs to speak and probably has very interesting things to say, more interesting than me. However, um, principle number one, already covered this, um, trustees' power of investment derived from trustees or governing documents, and if you are unincorporated uh, from the Trustee Act 2000, uh, 
Principle number two, your overarching duty as a charity trustee is to further the purpose of the trust. Uh, number three, that is normally achieved by maximising financial return. And when you are engaged with the Trustee Act 2000 or your charity engages the Trustee Act 2000, you need to have regard to the standard investment criteria in section four. Um, social investments or impact or program related investments uh, are made using separate powers. They're not uh, the same as the pure power of investment. Uh, five already flagged and actually could be quite useful to get your trustees out of a sticky situation. Uh, specific investments that are prohibited by the trustee or the governing instrument just simply can't be made. Um, six is important. So where trustees are of the reasonable view that particular investments potentially conflict with charitable purposes, the trustees have a discretion to exclude that investment. So aligning your direct and your indirect conflicts. Uh, they should exercise that discretion by balancing all relevant factors, including the likelihood and seriousness of the conflict and the likelihood and seriousness of any potential financial effect arising from the exclusion. Um, seven, when considering financial effect, trustees can take into account the risk of losing supporters or donors and damage to the charity's reputation, both amongst its beneficiaries and generally. So this is the court telling us that we can think about uh, relational and reputational factors when we are engaging in that balancing exercise uh, and deciding whether a uh, an investment should be made. Uh, eight, uh, a note of caution. So trustees need to be careful in relation to making decisions as to investments on purely moral grounds. So if we've already flagged, uh, there could be different legitimate moral views held by charity supporters uh, and beneficiaries on certain issues. Um, and then two really important ones, nine and ten. Nine, your trustee must act honestly, reasonably and responsibly and with all due care and skill when formulating the investment policy and they must exercise good judgment, especially if you've got reputational factors that you're considering. Now, ten is absolutely key and really important to emphasise. If that balancing exercise is properly done and a reasonable and proportionate investment policy is adopted, the trustees have complied with their legal duties. Uh, even if the court or another trustee or other trustees might have come to a different conclusion, it does not matter. As long as you've done that balancing exercise, you've done it properly and what you've come out with at the other end is reasonable and proportionate, you've complied with your duties. It does not matter that somebody else might have come uh, to a different decision. Uh, and so paragraph 78, really important point of the judgment uh, and the real value of the judgment for everybody else other than just the two charities in question. Uh, pausing briefly to mention CC14. Now, CC14 is the Charities Commission guidance that deals with the trustees' uh, powers and duties in relation to investments. Now, this was last updated in 2016, uh, and a consultation exercise had been launched in 2021. Uh, and actually, the um, new draft guidance is available on the government website. And I think I even quoted it in the uh, previous webinar that we did. Um, but that consultation was put on hold pending the decision in Butler Schloss. Um, now, for, again, for those of you that follow mine and Matt's junior programs on charities, you could be forgiven for thinking that I'm either always having a row with the commission or trying to start a row with the commission. Um, I promise you that is not the case. However, on this occasion, I would just urge some caution when using guidance CC14 at the moment. Um, so just remember CC14 is guidance, it's not law, uh, and it's the commission's interpretation of the law. Uh, and arguably it should now be revised in light of the Butler Schloss decision. Um, so when advising trustees, I think the first place they ought to be going now, instead of CC14, is probably the Butler Schloss decision. And I do think the risk, if you go to CC14 at the moment, uh, and also the draft guidance that was consulted on, um, that doesn't really emphasize that the real driving force is the uh, charitable purposes. Uh, and that where there is a direct conflict, the balancing exercise needs to be gone through and the charitable purposes should be the most weighty factor in that balancing exercise. I'm not sure that's entirely clear from CC14 uh, at the moment. 
Um, but the source is much clearer in this regard. Uh, and in particular, paragraph 78, as we've just gone through in very brief overview, is particularly helpful. And I think that really ought to be the starting point at the moment. That takes me then uh, to my final slide. So urge some caution on CC14. And then there are four uh, further notes of caution uh, of which I urge. Um, so I have said that the uh, decision in Butler's loss is a wider application and of wider interest. It's not just limited to divestment, it's not just limited to climate change. Um, and it was intended to bring clarity to the wider law and more generally, um, that is all true. However, I think there are four notes of caution. Um, the first is just remember that both of the charities in this case were trusts in the true sense, they're unincorporated. Um, and so the decision is made in the context of the Trustee Act 2000. Um, however, I do think it would be prudent for trustees of incorporated charities uh, to follow the decision, um, because you can well imagine that paragraph 78 in particular will be read across to charitable companies uh, and will be applied by analogies. Um, second point of caution, uh, the decision is not uh, or is only concerned with the pure power of investment. Uh, it's not, uh, so thinking about investment for financial return, um, it's not dealing with either program related investment, mixed motive or social investments. Uh, third point of caution, the court's blessing was given uh, in circumstances where it was anticipated that the investable universe would increase over time and that any financial detriment that would be suffered would be short term only. Um, the court might not have been so quick to bless something uh, that was the opposite, so where your investable universe might continue to decrease and where uh, financial detriment might be long term. Um, those are all factors, though, that I think the trustees ought to consider and take into account in performing the balancing act. But I'm not entirely sure it's something with which the court should interfere. Um, but I do think it's something that the trustees ought firmly to have two eyes on when they are conducting that balancing exercise. So the longevity of any financial detriment and also what's going to happen to your investable universe over time are very important factors to consider. Uh, and the fourth note of caution. Um, you must have a way of being able to assess whether an investment does or does not conflict with your charitable purposes. Um, in some instances, it will be fairly obvious. So the cancer charity and the tobacco companies being a really good example of perhaps an obvious one. Um, and I do think perhaps your um, metric of assessment or method of assessment um, is again a matter of trustee discretion, but you do need to set it out in the investment policy. How have you come to decide if something is or is not in conflict with charitable objects? Um, and so we know in Butler Schloss they chose um, things or, or investments that did not align with the Paris Agreement. Um, and I do think perhaps the more uh, specific you make your criteria or method of assessment, the less likely it will be that ambiguity will come to haunt your policy uh, and the question of morality might come into play. So. That is me, and that is my whistle stop tour of uh, Butler Sloss. I hope I have warmed up the crowd suitably, and I will hand over to our headline, and it's Matthew Mills. Good morning, everyone. I'm Matt Mills, and I'm here to talk to you about professional charity fundraisers. Now, charitable giving is as old, if not older, than the law of charity itself, but it took quite a long time for any laws to be passed specifically to regulate professional charity fundraising. But in the late 1980s, a flurry of reports were produced on this topic. And these reports noted three important developments in the charitable sector. Firstly, there'd been a growth in the number of fundraising charities, as opposed to charities which depended on an endowment. Secondly, there'd been an increase in the number of professional fundraisers who were assisting charities. And thirdly, there was growing public concern about the fees and practices used and charged by these fundraisers. With all that in mind, our first piece of general legislation was passed in 1992, part two of the Charities Act. Pursuant to that act, we got the Charitable Institutions Fundraising Regulations of 1994. And then in 2008, the Office of the Third Sector produced some helpful guidance on this legislation. 
That guidance is now only available on the National Archives website, but I've given you a link on the slide, which you can follow once you receive these slides after the session. With that background in mind, I propose to cover three main topics in this webinar. Firstly, who the law applies to. Now, there are three key phrases here professional fundraisers, commercial participators, and quasi-commercial participators. Secondly, I'll talk about what the law requires. Now, there are five main consequences of being regulated by this law. You need to have an agreement in the prescribed form with the charities. You need to give solicitation statements to the donors. You need to appreciate the donor's right to cancel. You need to keep good records and you need to transmit money or property to the charities in the relevant way. My final topic will be what happens if you fail to comply with those rules. And there are three broad categories of consequences, injunctions, winding up and direct to disqualification and potential criminal sanctions. So as you can see, we've got quite a lot to get through. I'll get cracking with topic one, who is regulated? Now the starting point, is that the act is drawn deliberately widely so as to apply to as many instances of business fundraising by third parties as possible. For example, the law doesn't just regulate fundraising for registered charities. It regulates fundraising for any institution which is established for charitable, benevolent, or philanthropic purposes. In other words, this covers fundraising for charity type organizations, both at home and abroad. So when I say a charity in this webinar, I'm usually, I generally mean that phrase, an institution which is established for charitable, benevolent, or philanthropic purposes. My second general comment is that unfortunately, since the act was published, it's been criticized for being not well drafted and not easy to apply in practice. Today, the biggest problem is that it's particularly difficult to know how it applies to online fundraising platforms and digital campaigns, which simply didn't exist when the law was written. In 2013, the government said that it would work with the charity sector to produce simple guidance on these problems, but obviously nothing was done about that. So we're still stuck with the relatively old law here. All right, let's start with the easy stuff. Who is not covered by these rules? Who does not need to worry? Firstly, a charity which fundraises for itself, for example, children in need. Secondly, charities which jointly fundraise for themselves, for example, if two cancer charities get together to put on a big event. Thirdly, one charity which fundraises for another charity. Now, these three exceptions come about because these rules are designed to regulate fundraisers. They're not designed to regulate the charities themselves because they're regulated by different provisions. Fourthly, individuals who enter sponsor events like the London Marathon and solicit sponsorship are unlikely to be covered because they're not doing this professionally for gain. But if you're given more than a thousand pounds of travel or accommodation expenses, then that might push you into the professional category as we see. So this isn't an absolute exclusion. Fifthly, fundraising organizations which are controlled by charities for which they fundraise are generally excluded. For example, if Cancer Research UK set up the Cancer Research UK Fundraising Limited company specifically to do its fundraising, that's unlikely to be covered by the Act. Again, the aim is to capture true third parties, not charities and their subsidiaries. The final point is that celebrities who lend their voices to TV or radio adverts are expressly excluded from the, the Act. So Rob Bryden can sleep easy. So that's who's not covered, but who is covered? Well, this is where we come to my three phrases. The first of which is professional fundraisers. Now the Act defines professional fundraisers as covering two types of people. The first is anyone who carries on a fundraising business. Great, that's pretty obvious. But fundraising business is defined as any business which is carried on for gain, wholly or primarily to solicit or procure money for charity. Now the key test there is wholly or primarily. And the simplest way to decide if a business is wholly or primarily doing this is to look at its annual reports, its most recent annual accounts and its website. 
Now the phrase for gain here covers being paid in money, but also receiving benefits in kind. For example, accommodation or travel. But it needs to be something more than just covering expenses. This needs to be a profit generating enterprise in some way. The second type of professional fundraiser is anyone else who, for gain, solicits money or property for charity. In other words, this is a company which fundraises for profit as part of its business model. So you can see that the two types of organization here share a common feature, which is that they are doing this for profit. Fundraising is specifically one of the ways that they run their business. Let me give you some examples to help. For example, middlemen who connect donors to charities and take a fee are likely to be professional fundraisers. Similarly, a company which is paid by a charity to persuade donors to sign up for direct debits is likely to be a professional fundraiser. Thirdly, someone who's engaged by a charity to assist them with applications to grant making bodies is again likely to be a professional fundraiser. Fourthly, someone who's paid by a charity to develop a fundraising strategy which involves seeking donations from the public, that's also likely to be a professional fundraiser. And fifthly, people who are paid by the charity to sell lottery tickets to raise money for the charity are again, professional fundraisers. The one exception to this is that if the fundraiser receives less than 10 pounds a day or less than a thousand pounds a year, then it's exempt from the rules. It's effectively a low value threshold, which is obviously very low. So that's our first group of people, professional fundraisers who fundraise specifically for money. Our second group is commercial participators. In a nutshell, a commercial participator is someone who promotes their own goods or services by saying that some of the proceeds or a donation will go to charity. Now let's break this down. Firstly, the organization must be independent of the charity. Remember what I said about subsidiaries earlier. Secondly, the business of a commercial participator is not primarily fundraising. They primarily do something else, sell carpets, paint doors, but they're using charity as a way of promoting themselves. So that means you can't be both a professional fundraiser and a commercial participator. Thirdly, the essence of a commercial participation arrangement is that the commercial participator makes a representation to the public. Now that representation can be in any manner whatever, whether expressly or impliedly. It can be in writing, it can be orally, it can be on an advert, it could even just be using a charity's logo on your products. Fourthly, the representation is that money will go to a named charity. So not just general charitable purposes. For example, if I say for every box of cornflakes you buy, 10p will go to save the children, commercial participator. But if I say for every box you buy, 10p will go to eradicating child poverty, not commercial participator, because that's about purposes, not a specific charity. The final point is that there is no low value exception. Remember what I said about 10 pounds a day or a thousand pounds a year for professional fundraisers? That doesn't apply to commercial participators. So even if you make the princely sum of one pound a year, in theory, you are caught by these rules. Let me give you some examples though, to show you both sides of the line. The classic example, a high street card shop, which sells Christmas cards, which say on the back, for every pack we sell, 10 people go to save the children. Commercial participator. Another example, an organization which runs a competition in which some of the proceeds are said to go to a particular charity. Again, you're a commercial participator. On the other side of the line, a bank which handles a charity's fundraising money in return for the usual banking fees is not a commercial participator. The bank's not making any representations. The bank is simply acting as a conduit and charging its usual fees. Similarly, a company which pays to sponsor a charity's event, which some of your firms might do, does not make you a commercial participator because you're not making a representation that if you buy a product, I will then give money to charity. You're effectively just making a donation to charity in return for some publicity. So those are arguments either side of the line. Our final category 
isn't actually defined in the Act. It's an inference from Regulation 7, and it's quasi-commercial participators. In a nutshell, this is someone who promotes their own goods or services by saying that the proceeds or a donation will go to general charitable purposes. Now remember, a commercial participator is someone who says this money is going to a specific charity, save the children. A quasi-commercial participator is someone who says this money is going to eradicating child poverty. That's the difference. So those are our three categories of people, professional fundraisers, commercial participators, quasi-commercial participators. So now we finally know who this act applies to, we can now talk about well, what does the act require? And in summary, there are five things that apply in most cases. The most important is that it's unlawful for a fundraiser to raise funds for a specific charity without an agreement in the prescribed form with that charity. It's important to emphasize in the prescribed form. If you have an agreement with the charity, but it doesn't satisfy the requirements, the fundraiser can't enforce it and the fundraiser can't claim any remuneration. So you don't just need any old agreement, you need the right agreement. And if you get this wrong, the agreement can't be enforced by the fundraiser and the fundraiser can't claim any money. So it's serious stuff. All right, so what is the right agreement? In summary, it's an agreement in writing that's signed by both parties that includes a very long list of things. Now I'll run you through them, but don't worry about writing them down or remembering them because you'll get the slides afterwards. You need to include the names and addresses of the parties, the dates on which those parties sign the agreement, the length of the agreement, and whether it can be ended earlier, for example, for breach or insolvency, whether the term can be varied, either to extend the term, change the promotion and so on. You also need to include a statement of the principal objectives of the agreement. For example, to raise the profile of the charity or to raise 10,000 pounds for a particular thing. And a statement of the methods of how the fundraiser can go about doing that by having a certain promotion or making certain adverts. You also need to cover how the money will be divided between charities if there's more than one charity. If you're a commercial participator, you also need to explain how much you'll give to the charity for each sale you make. You must also explain how much the fundraiser can charge for their services. And if the fundraiser agrees to be bound by the schemes of any voluntary organizations that govern fundraising. Importantly, you need to expressly state how the fundraiser will protect vulnerable people from unreasonable intrusion, unreasonably persistent approaches and undue pressure. Now, this is really important. This was one of the key reasons behind the act in the first place. The public were concerned that they were being unreasonably pestered by fundraising bodies. So each agreement needs to directly say how you're going to avoid that. Finally, the agreement needs to have a mechanism which allows the charity to monitor the fundraiser's performance, for example, by checking up or by receiving reports. So that's a very long list, as you can see. And I'd strongly recommend you get specialist advice if you want to draft one of these from scratch, because there's a lot to go in it. And if you're acting for the fundraiser and you get it wrong, it's pretty disastrous. So that was all consequence one. The second consequence of being regulated is that you need to provide a solicitation statement every time you contact a new potential donor or client. Now, the aim of this rule is to ensure that potential clients or donors can make an informed decision about whether they want to give some money or make a purchase. And a solicitation statement is simply some words that cover the following points. If you're raising money for general charitable purposes, you need to say this is for general purposes and not named charities and you need to explain how you'll choose who the money goes to. On the other hand, if you're raising money specifically for charities, you need to say who they are, and if there's more than one, in what proportions they'll benefit. You also need to explain how the fundraiser's remuneration is calculated. Is it a daily rate, is it a fixed fee, is it some other arrangement? And how much you estimate the fundraiser will be paid for the entire appeal. And if it's a long appeal for a big charity, that could be a lot of money. Finally, 
If you're fundraising through the TV, the radio, or over the phone, your statement also needs to explain the customer's right to cancel. Now I'll come to that in a minute, but don't forget to include it. As you can see, it's quite a long and turgid list of things you need to rattle off to these poor donors and purchasers. And unhelpfully, there is no particular form of words that you can trot out on every occasion. But Appendix B of the Cabinet Office guidance that I mentioned earlier on gives some precedence here. So if you're looking to draft this type of wording, I would suggest you start there. Once you've got the wording sorted, you need to work out how to deliver it. So for example, if you're running a street collection, you could display a statement either on your person or on your stand or nearby. If you're arranging a charity event, you could put it on the ticket or in the brochure, or maybe on an invoice if you send it in advance. Or if you're fundraising over the TV or radio, you're most likely to need to say it orally. But if someone buys something worth hundred pounds or more from a TV or radio advert, you also need to send them a written version within seven days. So you say it orally at the time, and then if it's hundred pounds or more that they spend, you send another written version. So if you've got an automated system which can deal with purchases without any human oversight, you need to make sure that system allows for the automatic sending of this statement. So that's all the second consequence of being regulated. Let's move on to the third consequence. And I mentioned it a moment ago. Donors or purchasers have the right to cancel a payment within seven days if three conditions are met. Firstly, they heard a TV or radio advert or they were solicited orally without being directly present, for example, over the phone or maybe over Skype. They then make a donation or a purchase worth £100 or more and they pay using a credit card or debit card. If those three criteria are met, they automatically have a right to cancel without any reason. And to exercise this right, they simply need to write to the fundraiser and say, I'm canceling my purchase or I want to revoke my donation. There's no prescribed form of words. There's no particular form because the law here is strict on fundraisers. It's not strict on consumers. Now there's some doubt over whether this type of notice can be sent by email. So I'd recommend that if you're acting for the consumer, you always suggest it's sent by post and ideally recorded delivery so you've got the evidence. Once the fundraisers receive the request, they're required to refund the full amount, less only any reasonable administration expenses, for example, staff charges or bank charges. If you're dealing with a commercial participator and you've bought some goods, then the right to refund is um, conditional on you giving the goods back, obviously, otherwise you'd have the goods for free. If you paid for services from a commercial participator and they've already performed those services, for example, they painted your door, then you can't claim a refund because otherwise you get the service for free. So that's really the only exception here to the right to cancel. If you've got the service already, you can't claim the refund. So that's our third consequence. Our fourth consequence is that any charity which is party to a prescribed agreement can at any reasonable time ask for a copy of the books, documents, or other records which the fundraiser holds and which relate to the charity and the agreement. For example, how the fundraising process is going, what information the fundraiser has about the charity on its books. Now the fundraiser can either just provide these documents directly to the charity, or they can allow the charity to come into its office and take copies. That's probably more unre unworkable, but it is an option. Importantly, this obligation continues for a reasonable period after the agreement has expired. So don't go shredding everything as soon as you finish the contract. You need to make sure that you keep these things for a reasonable period. Other than that, there's no real law or guidance here, so you've just got to apply your common sense. The final consequence of being regulated relates to how money and property is transferred from the fundraiser to the charity. Now, these rules apply regardless of any term in any agreement between the fundraiser and the charity. If you're dealing with money in checks, so you receive them from a donor, you need to transfer these to the charity as soon as reasonably practicable and in any event within 28 days, unless you've agreed a longer period or there's a reasonable excuse, for example, another lockdown or Christmas holidays. 
The fundraiser is not allowed to deduct their money, their fee from the money. They must transfer it in full and then claim their commission or their fee. As for all other property, it needs to be dealt with in accordance with the charity's instructions and be kept secure pending any delivery. If the fundraiser is allowed to sell the property to convert it to cash to give to the charity, then you need to treat that cash as money and checks, i.e. transfer it as soon as reasonably practicable and in any event within 28 days. So as you can see, there's quite a long list of onerous obligations on people who are regulated by these rules. But I'm afraid things can get worse for fundraisers as we move on to the topic of enforcement. There are three main procedural consequences of breaching these rules. The first is that in four situations, a charity may be able to get an injunction from the court, stopping a fundraiser from acting in four situations. Firstly, if the fundraiser is fundraising without a prescribed agreement. Secondly, if the fundraiser is using methods of fundraising that the charity objects to, for example, cold calling. Thirdly, if the fundraiser is not a fit and proper person to raise for the charity. Or fourthly, if the fundraiser is making representations or using promotions that the charity just doesn't want to be associated with. To pick up on something Natalie said, for example, I imagine Cancer Research UK would not want to be associated with a promotion on cigarettes. So those are the situations in which it's open to a charity to claim an injunction. To actually get one, the charity needs to persuade the court that the fundraiser will continue to act wrongfully unless the court makes an order. Also, if there is an agreement in the prescribed form between the charity and the fundraiser, you need to serve a written notice 28 days in advance on the fundraiser saying what they're doing wrong, asking them to stop and threatening to go to court. It's basically a pre-action letter. But you don't need to serve a notice if either there's no agreement and someone's just started fundraising for you, or you've previously served a notice in the last 12 months. You only need to serve one per 12 months, effectively. Now, there's no other remedy available here to the charity. You can't claim compensation. You can't claim the profits from the fundraiser. You can just get the injunction. But fortunately, this type of claim can be issued in either the county court or the high court. So it's relatively easy to get off the ground in a convenient place. And it's not just charities who can take steps to stop wrongful fundraising. The Secretary of State has the power under Section 124A of the Insolvency Act to petition the court to wind up a fundraiser if it's expedient in the public interest and just and equitable to do so. Now, there are two reported cases from the early 2000s in which the court used this power to wind up a fundraising company. In both cases, the company had essentially been retaining over 95% of all the money and only transferring on a very small percentage to the charities. So this gives you an idea of the seriousness of the situation that the court will expect to see before it acts. But if the court does wind up the company, it's also possible for the insolvency service to apply to court to have the director disqualified to stop them starting a new company and doing it all again. Now, in reality, these types of orders are very rare, so it's probably only in extreme cases that this would ever happen. But given that this could be an existential threat to a fundraiser, it's very important for you to bear this in mind on both sides of the fence, because it's either a serious risk for a fundraiser or a powerful tool potentially for a charity. The final potential consequence of ignoring these rules is the most serious, but it's also the least common. It's a criminal offence to fail to do any of the following things. Keep appropriate records, transfer property or money to the charity as required, provide appropriate solicitation statements to your donors or clients, and fundraise without a prescribed agreement in force. Now in situation three, if you fundraise without giving a solicitation statement, the fundraiser can try to rely on the defence that they took all reasonable precautions and all due diligence. For example, they gave their staff a script, they gave them training and they still didn't do it. But that only applies to situation three. You can't rely on that defence in the other contexts. So for example, if you're found not to keep appropriate records, then to be honest, you're pretty much stuffed. These offences are only punishable by a fine, but it's one fine per offence. So in theory, if you solicited 100 people, 
and didn't make any solicitation statements, you could in theory be liable a hundred times over. So in theory, there's quite a serious punishment here. However, and this is the big caveat, there are no known prosecutions of the offences. In fact, the government has said that it believes the mere possibility that there's criminal sanction here is enough to deter people from doing things wrong. Now, it's a bit of a heavy question for a Thursday morning to ask, is a law right if it's never enforced? So I'll simply stop there and say thank you very much for listening. Claire has asked, have you ever seen non-compliance with the commercial participator regime enforced? The short answer is no. There are virtually no cases, no criminal prosecutions. There is very, very little here. Very occasionally, in very serious cases, the Charity Commission might open a statutory inquiry into the charity if it is not doing its bit to have a proper fundraising arrangement, but there's really very little. So I'm afraid the answer is no. Anonymous has asked a very similar question. Do you have any examples of enforcement for failure to comply with the fundraising regulation? Again, the answer is no. As I just said, there are so few reported cases here that we really don't have much to go on. The best way to work out what is and isn't allowed is to probably look at that government guidance that I put the link to in my slides from the third sector, Office for the Third Sector. Um, let me have a look. There's quite a long question here, and the short, answer, short version of it is from Claire, is that where you're receiving funds from any location, including abroad, is it safest to pass all funds over within 28 days? And when does this period start from? So it starts from when you receive the money. And in my view, it is always safest to try and pay it over within 28 days. Um, in my view, there's generally no real reason to keep hold of the money for more than a month after you've received it, unless there's a particularly good reason. Nowadays, with, for example, faster payments, you can receive money and pay it out on the same day. So generally, 28 days, in my view, would be the safest and most fair thing for the charity to do. Because remember, on the other side of the fence, the charity is going to be negotiating with its lawyers and it's not going to want to say, sure, you can hold our money for 90 days, unless there's a good reason. I think that there's one question for me. Um, so could the trustees of the Ashton and Mark Leonard Trusts uh, have avoided litigation by changing the investment powers in the trust deed? Um, so it's certainly true that if your trust deed or your governing document prohibits or excludes certain type of investments, that eradicates the question of whether you should or shouldn't make that investment. I think if you're trying to uh, retrospectively change your governing document where the uh, prohibition isn't already in there, you're still going to be captured and caught by almost exactly the same uh, considerations, the same sort of duties and considerations and balancing exercise uh, will apply to you. It's probably easier to do wholesale uh, exclusions and prohibitions uh, if you're drafting from afresh, if you're setting up a new trustee or a new governing document. So I think if you're going to try and uh, curtail investment powers uh, whilst there is already a governing document in play, I think you probably are going to be captured by the same sorts of considerations as if you were trying to make those curtailments through uh, an investment policy. There's one question from Tessa. A small charity engages a fundraiser, brackets, self-employed, to help with a large appeal. Is this person a professional fundraiser? Um, my view is it's likely to be yes, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the first quote I put up says that these rules are ex interpreted expansively to cover as many people as possible. Secondly, I think from your question, what you're saying is this self-employed person earns their living by doing this, by helping charities raise funds. And that means they're effectively making a profit from fundraising for other charities, which is exactly what these rules are designed to cover. Excellent. Well, um... If Matt is done, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us. Thank Bye. you very much.